welcome to Where's My Sports At? My guest on today's podcast is Todd Morgan, and we are going to be talking about how mental health affects sports people. Todd is the CEO of Outside the Locker Room, an organization that delivers critical education on mental health and other social issues via sporting clubs, schools, and businesses across Australia. Todd, thank you very much for coming on today. I really appreciate your time. Thanks for having me, Craig. I'm kind of excited for this one. This is going to be good. So can we start you off by getting you to do a bit of an intro about yourself and outside the locker room? Easy, mate. I'd, uh, as you said in the intro there, Todd Morgan, I'm the CEO for OTLR. I've been uh, in the mental health industry for almost 10 years now, I think, and been with OTLR for pushing on seven years this year, which is pretty exciting, and three years as CEO. And We've worked with over 1,200 uh, 1200 sessions in sporting clubs, schools and businesses. Uh, we've worked with, I think we're pushing 58,000 participants as well. And a uh, really big year for us last year. We, we partnered with over 37 different sporting associations and leagues right around the country from all different sports. So that's national-based bodies to state-based bodies to just your local local leagues. Uh, for us, that was a, a really big push into the sport. We were, sort of had four in 2023, uh, sorry, 22. And then in 23, we built that up into 37 and looking to probably have about 50 by the end of this year, which would be great. And you know, we sort of started that off the back of, hey, what do you have around mental health in your own association? Uh, and they said nothing and said, look, we've got some really good resources and some really good processes and procedures in place. And can become your what we call your well-being partner or your mental health partner for that association uh, so that when something does come up then we're there to support you and, and help you through it and we have the contacts and the networks for that so a good year for us is uh is no news uh, if we're just calling these associations to find out that yep the year went well and grand finals look good or whatever it may be and, and there's actually no news in our field that's actually a good thing uh, it's a really hard sell to some people to be like, hey, if you don't contact us for 12 months, that's actually a positive. Uh, and it's a real weird thing. Most businesses obviously want contact. They want people getting calling them out. But for us, it's, you know, we don't we don't want any of that. We just want you guys to get through the year and, and, and have no challenges. But if you do have one, we're there. So it's a pretty, um, been a pretty good space for me to walk into. I love sport. I'm an absolutely terrible footballer. Always was, always will be. That's AFL football for your listeners. I now coach the reserves at my local side, which is kind of nice. Did the first sort of scratch match last night as coach and we dominated the first quarter. So I have that over the senior coach, which is quite quite nice as well. He was not too happy about that at quarter time. Uh, so made a few changes, stole a few plays, and then they ended up coming back. So it was about a draw in the end. We don't score in a scratchy. But very excited for that for this year and uh, myself in mental health, I never went through any challenges myself or, or any challenges in my family growing up. And so that sort of lived experience from having gone through that journey is probably what surprises people for that I got into this role and got into this industry. Uh, but I think, out, and I'll trigger warning here, and we'll talk about suicide and self-harm today. That's just the nature of, unfortunately, the industry that I'm in. Um, but was confronted with suicide at seven years old. That was the first time I'd ever come across that or, or knew what it was. Uh, and then consistently throughout my life, there's, you know, sort of 16, 19, 21, 26. That includes some, uh, you know, people passing away from overdoses, people passing away from car accidents and just, just general life deaths, unfortunately, throughout my life. So sort of watching, I guess, the negative side of, of mental health has been there throughout. It wasn't the defining factor to get into the mental health field. I sort of did it because I, you know, wanted to volunteer somewhere and and had a contact that was running a mental health organisation. So I got in there, but then unfortunately had a mate pass away, and his mum called me up, and I know exactly where the where we were, what cafe we were in, what the weather was like, where we were sitting in that cafe, and she said, "I want you to stop being a, a personal trainer or a strength conditioning coach, and I want you to go and." Go and tell Fitzy's story that sporting clubs are pretty amazing and they're great communities. And, and, you know, if he was still a part of one, things may have been different. So you have at a sporting club, 60 to 100 to 150 mates, depending on what club you're at. And, you know, you're not unique. Uh, I use that a lot in my talks and when I run workshops is that your journey is not unique. It's new, unique to you. And, and some of the things that you've gone through are, are definitely, you know, they're going to have a massive effect on you. But... When we run our education sessions, and I'll talk about what OTLR does in a second, what one person's gone through, there's usually four or five people in the room that have gone through something similar. And so sitting there and going, I'm alone, 
you know, no one else is going to get what I'm going through. I'm unique. This journey is harrowing. You know, there's no way out of this. You're completely wrong. And we don't tell people enough nowadays that they're wrong or we don't tell them no. We see that in society. But as soon as we do that, people sort of, you can see people in the room, they just relax. And they go, oh, okay, well, actually, there may be other people in this room that have gone through, you know, maybe drug addiction or alcohol addiction, or they've gone through a divorce. So they've gone through family dramas, or they've gone through, you know, a career ending injury, or they've gone through a seizing an injury. So people that sit there and they go, this is the world falling down on me. I'm the only one that's going through this. To actually turn around and tell them, no, you're not alone. Um, is a massive weight off their shoulders. And I, I do that a lot in my sessions that, hey, you're not unique and, and there's going to be 150 people in this room. You'll find five or six that are doing pretty much the same thing or have gone through it in the past that you can learn from. And, and that's the messaging that Deb Fitzy's mum wanted me to go out there and tell that, you know, if he was part of, of a sporting club still and, and still involved in that environment, then things may have been different and that's the story she wants me to tell is stay involved as a supporter or a volunteer or a committee member for as long as you possibly can what we do at outside the locker room is we go out into sporting communities we also do schools and businesses as well and we provide 60 minute education sessions so the first one's always on mental health and we look at both the positives and the and the negatives of mental health so question is you know what do you do for fun what makes you happy and we actually ask people to list you know two things and you'll find 50 percent of the room struggle to find two things that's a pretty damning thing on society and then we go into you know what are the signs and symptoms of someone going through a mental health challenge and we go right well, can you give me 10 of them and within 60 seconds you can get 10 uh but you turn around and then go could you give me 10 of or what do you do for fun what makes you happy as an individual person in 60 seconds and a lot of people struggle uh so we try and flip the narrative a little bit on that mental health isn't just as soon as you say mental health everyone just goes straight to the negative, depression, anxiety, bipolar, ADHD, schizophrenia, all those really challenging aspects. But it's also right, well, what's the positive things that we're doing to hopefully prevent and starve off those those aspects that are that are in the negative or all the challenged ones. So it's pretty eye opening for a lot of people to be like, I've missed the basics. You know, what do you do for fun? What makes you happy? It may be watching a sunrise or a sunset, maybe watch, you know, having your coffee in the morning. It may be that, you know, conversation with your partner in the morning before you go to work or your morning walk with the dogs. There's, there's so many and there's a wide range of things and everyone's going to be different uh, in what makes them happy and what they do for fun. But again, you're not unique. So I love telling this story. I did a, I did a sporting club in Northern Territory. There's not much to do up there. And uh, 98% of them, aren't from the Northern Territory because a lot of them go there to play footy in, in the off season. And so what do you do for fun? What makes you happy? And 98% of the room wrote fishing. And I'm like, oh, wow, everyone in here likes fishing. And you had people looking across the table at each other going, oh, do you like wow. fishing? And then the other guy's like, yeah, well, I like fishing. It's like, well, we should go fishing together. And I had to ask the question. I was like, you guys are idiots. Tell them you know each other for and they're like five years. It's like, you never knew that you like going fishing. Because no one ever asked that question. Everyone asked, what do you do for work? How's life? How's the kids? You know, are oh, you going through a difficult time? What's happening? But no one ever turns around and goes, are you happy? And no one asks that question. And then no one ever asks, well, what are the things you enjoy doing? Oh, you like playing golf? I like playing golf. Maybe we can play golf. Um, so the people you thought that weren't going to be your mates sometimes become your closest friends because you've got more in common with each other than you thought you knew. So we do that. We do two 60-minute sessions per um, sporting season with clubs. Behind the scenes as well, we provide a, a, the OTLR app, which is what we call the, the welfare app. So in that is connections to crisis support services, so your lifeline, lifeline tech support. We've also got our own referral um, counselling service that people can you know fill out an expression of interest form. They can get counselling support straight away. And the joys of COVID is obviously stuff like this where we can do podcasts, we can do our counselling sessions over Zoom or on the computer, which is great. It works really well for our communities because we do a lot of regional and rural. Uh, so there's not many services out there. A lot of people are coming back into the city rather than going out to that country living. So your closest service could be three, three and a half hours away and they've got a six to 12 month wait list, which is just the nature of our, our mental health system at this point in time. So having that option there is, is really good. We've got resources through that app as well. But again, it's the safety net of our organisation. It's the support that we provide that we hopefully never have to provide to these communities. So be able to say, yes, we're, we're a mentally safe organisation. Well, what are you doing? Well, outside the locker room come in, they do two education sessions, they provide an app. We're able to call them at any time for advice. 
around what do we do in this situation moving forward? Um, because when you're talking about even from elite level all the way down to grassroots, elite level, they may be getting paid, but grassroots, most of them are volunteers, but it's, they're still the same because a lot of them potentially haven't had the training to be able to deal with a certain situation or know what services to point them in the direction of. So they call us and go, hey, can we help us put a plan together so we know what we're, what we're doing? Um, and we're able to help out. But we also provide you know, mental health first aid training as well so that organizations can have people in their communities that they can get turned to and say, hey, what do I do? And they've at least got that you know, certificate accreditation to be able to support. So there's a wide range of things that we do, but going back to the basics is the education, providing that awareness, bringing communities together uh, and getting them to open up about both their positive and their challenge mental wow. health. Wow, there's a lot there. There's, you do so much. It's much more than what I, I thought the organization did when I was looking you up on the website. Yeah, it's, it's hard. With the website, we need to update. But it, it's hard to try and put it all into context so that organizations or, or, or sporting clubs know what we do. Um, and once they call up, they probably have the same reaction as what you did you do a, you do a lot more and what we're trying to do is we're just trying to at least give our our clubs and our associations and our schools the sort of a one-stop shop now we know we can't do everything and we're not saying that we do it all we've just got a lot of partners that we can refer to as well so if there is a someone who goes i need counseling we've got a partnered service that does that outside the locker room doesn't do it we go yep you can reach out to these guys or hey there's been a, a death it doesn't have to be a suicide it could just be you know a stalwart of the club unfortunately you know, an older person passed away, natural causes, but it's affecting the club a lot. What can we do? And we can provide an organization that does some grief servicing or does a grief workshop to help people work through what they're feeling. Or, you know, if there is a, a suicide or a self-harm, then we've got an organization that can help out with that as well. And if we don't know what we're, you know, if we don't have someone or we don't know a, a an organization or a service to point in the direction of, we'll just say, look, we're not sure, but let's let's research together and we'll try and find something local uh, so we're not getting a service from Perth trying to mm -hmm. you know, service an outback New South Wales uh, community. But at times, sometimes that does have to happen. You know, it is just the nature of if you are five hours from Sydney and five hours from Melbourne in the middle of nowhere in New South Wales, guaranteed you're probably not going to have too many services in that area that's going to be able to help. So we'll do our best, but you know, at least sporting clubs and schools and businesses know that they get someone to turn to and that's what we try and build for them. You know, the hope is that we're not doing this forever. The hope is we can work with a lot of, a lot of other organizations and actually change the actual landscape of mental health. And especially in sport that sporting clubs and sporting associations and you know, national peak bodies that are really governing sport can put in place practices and procedures and policies that every single club's mentally safe. They know where to go to turn to for support. They know what education they need to provide. And you know, the hope is in 10 years time outside the locker room doesn't need to be here because we've done our job too well. Um, so it's, I know I'm not gonna be doing this forever. So let's grab some souvenirs from, you know, from communities that are great to go and support. Uh, and I can look back on it one day and go, yeah, look, we, we did that. We worked with those communities, but we also changed the landscape for athletes and for administrators so that they had the right policies, the right processes in place to support everybody. So talking about landscape, and it sounds amazing that you get to go to all of these places and, and meet so many people and spread the word, you know, it's you're doing a great job. So when you talk about landscape, as a casual observer, even though I work in the mental health industry as well, but as a casual observer of sports, it looking from the outside, it doesn't seem as though mental health is something that is is talked about very much, you know, and my point of reference here, and it's probably not a good point of reference, is I watch a lot of these sports documentaries on TV, you know, you had um, Drive to Survive, you had Full Contact for Rugby, um, you had, a, I think, a golf one, a tennis one, and you can see a lot going behind on behind the scenes for the players and drivers and athletes, you know, a lot of pressure, and, and, and they deal with the same things that we as non-professional sports people deal with in in, in life um, but it's really doesn't seem to be talked about as much mental health what are you noticing on the ground because you're on the ground what are you seeing is there more of an appetite for the conversation there definitely needs to be and, and you know you can look at those documentaries and understand that yeah, there's not i'm not seeing much of the, the mental side of thing that's going into the preparation behind the scenes and I think a lot of it is still being put onto the coach. But when you are the coach, you've got so much else to think about that 
you know, the mental health side of things is, is one aspect. And a lot of coaches are probably not from the age where mental health or mental fitness or mental skills or mental tactics, whatever you want to call it, mental well-being. You know, there's so many different names for it that choose differently in all sporting clubs. It is still probably not put up there as one of the biggest things. And it's still probably not a driver from the club for your elite athletes to potentially have the sports psychologist. Now, some clubs do it really, really well. And if I just take the AFL, for example, COVID obviously hit. And one of the first ones to go from a lot of these clubs was your sports psychologist or your mental fitness. Or, you know, you've, you've, so they sort of, instead of doing their two days of the week, they did get pulled out. And a lot of the, um, you know, the, the elite level clubs, they may not have a mental well-being person there full time. Uh, which again, if they've only got one person, you're, you're dealing with that person dealing with you know, 45, 50 players on an AFL list and depending what other sport you've got, that's a big workload for only one person. Uh, so there's a, you know, five, six, seven, eight people that are in marketing, but also marketing brings in money. Uh, so there's five people on the marketing team, but one person on the mental wellbeing team that sometimes will get dragged into working with the, the administrators as well. So it does probably need to be a shift because we do hear about coaches. We hear about athletes that talk, once I got my mental state better, you know, once I you know started focusing on that, my performance increased. And it's like an age old adage that that's there all the time. And you could go back hundreds of years and you see that once my, my mental side of my performance was there, then my performance on or off the field, on the field or on the court, whatever it may be, it really, really improved. So if we're looking at that and going, okay, well, winning brings in money, then we've seen it throughout history that the mental side of things is going to bring wins. Then maybe we need to invest in that side of things as well, uh, as much as what we do in the physical. Uh, and there's probably still a little bit of a stigma on mental health because you use the word mental health. Where does most people's minds go? They, it goes to the negative. It goes to, okay, well, they've got depression. They've got anxiety. I'm not actually going there. For the, the positives, I'm actually just going there because I've got a challenge. And when someone goes, hey, you've got to go talk to a counsellor or a psychologist or a sports psych, their focus turns to, well, I've got, to, I've got to go and talk about my deepest, darkest feelings. I've got to talk about all the things that are going wrong. Whereas going to see one of those types of people or where there's a mental coach, it doesn't matter, is I'm going to talk to them about performance. I'm going to talk to them about the good things as well and celebrate those things so that they can actually turn to me some days and go, hey, your performance wasn't good on the weekend. We get that, all right? You've got to pick yourself back up in six days' time. You've got another game. Are you doing the things that you do for fun, what makes you happy? Because they're your recovery for your mind, just like you do your ice bath, just like you do your massage for your recovery for your body. So you're, you know, one that they probably should do, do a documentary on, uh, and you can go and have a look at this, and it's quite good, is the Queensland uh, State of Origin team. They use the resilience project. So Hugh Van Kleinberg, he's in he's I think he's been a part of them for the last three or four years. But obviously with the resilience project, they're all about the positives, you know, the gratitude, the empathy, and the mindfulness. And having obviously him involved is a, a really, really good thing. And if you haven't seen Hugh do his presentation or his talk before, he does make a small joke that in 2017 he went and did his workshop and his talk at the Richmond Football Club and then they won the grand final at the end of the year. And he goes, oh, I'm not saying it come down to me. And it's, it's just a nice little joke and it's a, it's a really good leeway into it. But it's kind of true. And I'm talking about this from a different organization. I'm pumping up Hugh's tires because he does such a great job. But the flip of mental health is all about the negative to mental health encompasses everything and it can do sport and it, uh, so, um, performance. And going into the positive side of things as well. Okay, why am I not performing? Oh, my body's not up to it. Well, have you gone fishing if you like fishing? Have you walked the dogs lately? Or have you just tried to recover your body and done nothing for your mind? So you can't perform if your mind your, your mind's on an empty cup. You need to fill that up as well. Interesting what you were saying about COVID hit and the first person to let go was the, the mental health well-being person. Yet at a time like COVID, it seems from a, a, a well-being point of view, that that's the person you'd need on more than the five marketing people. That sort of just stands out to me straight away. 
Yeah, I think I think I, I won't say they're the first people that was just a figure of speech, but I, I know a lot of clubs. You know, they did let that person go, or they reduced their hours. So they may have been on four days of the week, and they reduced down to one just because of you know the soft cap and those sorts of things. I don't know what it was like in in sort of other sports, but I was you know reading between the lines in articles on AFL because I'm you know in the heartland of AFL here in Victoria. You know, that you did see a lot of administrators and a lot of coaches and a lot of people did get let off or they got on to reduced hours and that mental well being one was probably one of the ones that did come down as well. Um it is a it's a really big thing and I think coaches have a really big part to play. Um if you're talking, you know, from elite sport all the way down to grassroots, but so do you your committees and your administrators in elite to grassroots as well and putting a priority on it. You know, we are eight years into OTLR, we still have to work quite heavily through, sorry, nine years this year, sorry, I almost cut a year off us, but, um, you know, we still have to work at, at times quite heavily through your local grassroots based, both associations, leagues, and, you know, down into their clubs to get people to understand that this is really important thing that they need at their, they need at their club, they need at their league. And we, you know, it's, we're nine years in and we're still fighting that same battle that we fought for the last nine years. And you've only got to have a go and have a look at a lot of the really successful coaches uh, across all sports to understand that they've taken a holistic view on mental health, which is also about getting to know your players means you get to know their personalities, you get to know who they are and what they're like, and you then get to know what makes them tick, both from a physical performance and mental performance aspect. So the way one person recovers is going to be completely different than the way another person recovers. And what they also need to recover their mind for their performance is completely different than someone else. And for anyone that's out there that hasn't watched The Last Dance with the Bulls, you just got to go and watch it. But Dennis Rodman comes in and goes, I'm going to go to Vegas for two days just so I can feel better. And Michael Jordan goes, well, that just sounds stupid. But then they, they're playing two different roles, but you can then see the coach go, no, let's make this happen. And then the performance increases on those sides. Now, how you deal with each different person as a coach and their mental health and their well-being is completely different. You have to take that on board. It's not just stand there, here's some tactics and off you go, but you've got to be able to manage all different types of players um, in their own individual way. Um, because everyone's going to be motivated by different things. And a coach that goes in there heavy handed is probably not going to work nowadays. You've got to find where the balance so it's is. It's a very different skill set that um, professional athletes are looking for from a coach nowadays, isn't it? It is. You, like, I'm a Collingwood supporter, <laughs> mate. I probably just lost half your <laughs> listener base there now, I know. Um, but you look at the Craig McRae side of things you listen to any podcast that he's been on, but he actually took that same approach, which is everyone's got to be completely different and they've got to understand their roles and you've got to understand what makes them tick and, and so on and so forth. So someone like Isaac Quayna, for example, you know, back on the treadmill straight the day after the grand final, you know, getting his recovery in and, you know, pushing his fitness and those sorts of things, completely different from some other players. Some other players probably just want to just go and zone out and take the next seven weeks off and forget about football. And some of them want to keep that same routine because it helps with their mental well-being and their performance as well from a mental side. So some just need that full break and, and some need to keep the routine all the way through. That's just how they're wired and how they are. But if you don't know that about players, you're not going to be able to turn around when things start to go poorly let's say Isaac Quainer has some bad games coming up in the next couple of weeks you're probably going to find that Craig McRae is going to turn around and say hey have you done your normal routine okay you, you well let's go and have a look at your normal routine we can see this has come out well this is obviously going to affect your mental well-being you're not getting up and walking the dog so you're not starting your day how you usually are it's not giving you that kick of endorphins in the morning because you're so hyper focused on your performance right now that you're going, I need more sleep or I, you know, so you've completely lost that routine. And when anyone starts to get really down on themselves from the performance aspect, this is in sport or in life, they really keep jumping into the battle as much as they can. Whereas one of the best lines that I've heard and, and I've got told was you can't see the whole battlefield if you're in the battle. And usually when things start to go wrong, we push ourselves more into the battle rather than taking half a step back and going, let me just have a look at the whole battlefield here. Let me have a look at my routine. Let me have a look at my self-care strategies. Let me have a look at my mental well-being tactics that I put in place. Let me have a look at my recovery, my strength and conditioning. Okay, I'm lacking in 
this area. I'm lacking in all areas. This is what I need to build back up that I've lost thinking that if I go and do something else, it's going to make me perform better. No, I've got to go back to basics. Um, so coaches do that really well and they understand what back to basics means for all their players. So when you go into clubs and you deliver this message, is your target audience players, um, family members, or administrators and coaches? Because it sounds like they're the ones who carry a lot of weight and, and power within the clubs. Are they um, on board with this? So we we target everybody. So we actually go into a sporting club and we go, right, we want all your players here. We want all your coaches. We want your volunteers, your committee members, and anyone else that wants to come and be involved in the session, bring them down. Um, and every every sport and every club is different. Uh, so every club we go into, it's never going to be the same. And an example of that is quite a really successful club. Their administrators were great. Their coaches were great. Everyone said the same thing. It's a, it's a great community to be involved in. We're enjoying being a part of this club and it, it's really, really um, helping us. And, and they were great. They had two women's teams. They had four netball teams and this, this was a football club and they had your seniors reserves, 18s. But when we got down to it, our sessions are quite interactive and we got down to actually talking about their culture. It was actually the under 18s that spoke up and said, actually, this is what needs to be improved. Um, and now if we had just gone in there and just done coaches, well, everyone would have walked out going, yep, coaches are great. We already knew that. Whereas the, you know, the under 18s in this club turned around and actually said, yeah, this club is awesome, but we play at 9.30 on a Saturday morning and we see no senior players there. No one comes to support us. Uh, and then you expect us to stay around all day and support the women's team, support the two, support the ones, go over and have a look at the netballers. But we see no one coming to support us. Now, I, I actually played against this club, but my, my local team played against this club in the last round. And I got there at 9.30 to watch our own 19s and everyone was there from this club. Their seniors, their reserves, all their women's side, the netballers had come over to have a look. They had so many supporters there at 9.30 in the morning. You would have thought it was 2.30 in the afternoon before the senior started. And it was just off that comment there. And that's just one example of one club where out of nowhere, you wouldn't have thought the messaging would have come from that group. But then you go to another club and, and you know, the messaging is completely different. So if we didn't encapture the whole community and we only focused on one aspect, we wouldn't know where the challenges are to improve and we wouldn't know where the really positive things are and try and maintain that. Um, so we try and bring everybody together, give everyone a voice. I want to ask you now, so in relation to these health and wellbeing offices that these professional sports clubs have, and they, they probably use different names, what sort of work do they do within the club? It's a good question, mate. I don't have intimate knowledge of it. So I can't, I mean, I can't go into the nitty gritty details, but I can just go off the knowledge that I do have um, with some of the people that I have worked with. And really it is just going right back to basics. They really, are, you know, number one, try and identify if they can notice that any of their athletes or any of their players are going through potentially a mental health challenge or just going through a difficult time. We know that professional athletes are, just like you or I, they have breakups. They fail at their uni exam if they're they're studying while they're they're doing their elite sport. They've they've got money troubles. They've got injury troubles. They've got, you know, everything the same as what we do. They they hit too many red lights on the way to training and they were five minutes late. You know, that happens as well. So it's also it's trying to identify those things, jumping on top of them as soon as they possibly can. Uh, but a lot of the you know mental fitness offices or mental well-being offices of sport psychology, uh, sports psychologists that are in clubs are trying to get players to go back to basics, remove the pressure that they're probably putting on themselves. And obviously the, the public is as well through media and, and so on and so forth. We saw it with Ash Johnson from Collingwood just this week, had to delete his social media for the abuse that he was copying from mainly Collingwood fans here in Victoria. Um, so obviously identifying that, but then also bringing them, keep saying back to their basics. Okay, what are you doing that's keeping you positive? What are what are your self care strategies? Are you spending much time with your family and your kids? Getting these elite athletes that are so hyper focused on what they need to do, so hyper focused on their performance, dealing with so many outside pressures that a lot of you know your grassroots athletes aren't dealing with they can quickly forget that by doing the little things is, is going to be 
massive for their performance when moving forward. So making sure they're spending enough time with their family, making sure that they're walking the dogs, doing their recovery. It really isn't much different from a counsellor at a local level. So if a local sporting club has got a counsellor or a psychologist to come in and, and check on the well-being and the welfare of their community, it's really not much different. We think it would be an overly high standard and they would be, you know, going into these really scientific things well most of the time it's just coming back to the basics just making sure that they're having fun making sure that they're enjoying the environment that they're in and if they are performing poorly on the field or on the court making sure that's not transferring over into their off field as well and and working with them to try and improve their performance now what we need to understand too is that especially in team sports there's only one ball so not everyone can touch it all the time. So what if you're only not getting much touches one week, you may get it the next week. But if you let that one week detriment the whole Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then on the Saturday, you then perform poorly again, then you're compounding the problem. But if you can learn to build resilience and let it go, and I think that's what a lot of these sports psychologists are trying to build into these elite athletes, build that resilience. What are your self-care strategies to let that poor performance go and not let it ruin your routine for the next week? And then your performance should improve the week after or hopefully will improve the week after. That's right. You know, I definitely feel for these people in their positions. You know, people look at them and go, oh, well, you've got money, you've got fame, you've got prestige, you've, you've got all this stuff. But then, as you, you pointed out, they're facing the same challenges that we are as humans, but they're at an elevated pressure level because of you know expected performance like you talked about the fans you know abusing that person and as an All Blacks fan we see that when the All Blacks don't win the World Cup you know the fans come out and they and they get stuck into them. You're right the pressure that you know elite athletes are under is quite big you know having thousands of people abuse you through social medias or over the fence and is not uh, is not what we need and, and not what we need in society anyone that feels like they can do that over the fence or they can do it on social media um go and say it to your you know, these are your favorite athletes and then the next day you're abusing them now would you go and say it to their face no you'd probably want to be asking them for a selfie and a photo and then get their signature uh, so you need to have a good hard look in the mirror at yourself um you'd probably build up your resilience and go out and see a counselor or a psychologist and work out what's going wrong in your life i'm pretty brutal on anyone that's you know bullying online or, or bullying over a fence and especially at referees for me as well referees never umpired a day in my life but Anyone that abuses a referee over the fence or on social media, I'll give you a whistle and see how long you can last. Um, it, it falls away pretty quickly. But we, you know, where a lot of elite athletes or athletes in general really struggle is they there's a lot of pressure on the outside, but they also build up a lot of pressure on themselves. Um, but then also that transition out of sport is really difficult for a lot of athletes as well that they haven't. If you've got an elite athlete that's gone from you're the best in high school to you get drafted or you go into a professional athlete straight out of high school, you then spend however many years you do in that sport. You feel like that's going to be your career, but we know, especially with sport, it is not a lifelong journey. So if you go and study accounting, well, accounting can be your job for the rest of your life if you want to. Whereas playing football, playing rugby, it's it's not going to be your job for the rest of your life. So I'm trying to get into play in the All Blacks is how many players in the All Blacks? Say you know, 22 players at a time, 23, all right? Now then you want to go and work in media. So you've got to go from 23 players that potentially all want to work in media to you've only got five spots in media to go and work in. So you've gone from high school, I want to get the best side to then I want to play for the All Blacks so then I want to get into media. Very rare it's going to be your whole career. And this is what these athletes back in high school don't really get told that much is, are you going to make the All Blacks? It's going to be fine. Well, what happens when you get an injury? Or what happens when you do spend your 15 years in the All Blacks, but then you transition out? What's your job going to be? And they really struggle to acclimatize back into normal life. And where this is seen as well is it's seen in the military. When people go into the military, they spend however many years in the military, they transition back out and they really struggle to acclimatize back into I guess, what a normal life would be. So when we're talking about mental health, we're talking about players who really go into depression or anxiety or have really bad challenges once they leave sport. What was the support for their transition out of that sport from their high school days through their professional days and then afterwards? 
most of the time, if you sit them down and talk to them, there wasn't that much support for transition. And is this something that clubs, and it's sort of a bit off, off topic, something that clubs do? Because obviously, you know, it's almost like players are a commodity, aren't they? You know, they're, they're, they're super important at the club when they're playing well and they're needed. Yeah. But, you know, there's always new ones coming through. There's always new people coming through for your position. Is it something that clubs put much focus on? Or is it that sort of more left to the player to plan out their own future? There is, um, you know, there is the your club wellbeing officers and your, your career officers that are, are at clubs that will encourage you to, you know, some players want to get into a trade. So if they've got the time, they've got the ability, you know, in postseason, they'll go and do, you know, some work experience. So they'll do their trade courses to be able to get their trade to then move into that trade once they've done, or they'll go to uni and they're encouraged to go to uni. But how deep dive do some of these players go really depends on the player. Um, and we see this as well, you know, we obviously see it in elite level, but, you know, we see it in grassroots level as well, where people will play sport, you know, until they're 32 or 35, doesn't matter what sport it is. Then they transition out. They lose that social aspect. Now you lose that Tuesday, Thursday night with a hundred mates. They lose the Saturday game with their mates. And then you've probably got 500 other people down there, depending on what sport you play, but you know, your, your supporters and your volunteers from both clubs coming together and you've got that social aspect. Now, when they transition out, they lose that social aspect of their sport. So it becomes a really difficult thing, even for grassroots level. Now at elite level, are they pushing it? Now, this is probably what we see the most of and what we hear the most of is in high school and if they're not pushed to, you know, study well or understand what they want to do outside of sport and have a plan B, there are a lot of parents nowadays that are pushing that there's no plan B. And I was listening to the the podcast that you had before with, was it Wayne? Wade Goldsmith. The episode before this, Wade Goldsmith. And he was talking about a, a young netballer and the family was going to move to Auckland. Um, and around, you know, she was only 10 and around, Okay, well, do you have other kids? Yes. Are they in school? Yes. Do you have jobs? Yes. Well, the parents can get hyper-focused on just the sporting aspect and going, okay, well, you're good enough to make it. We know you're good enough to make it. Oh, wow, you're actually on the you know, the mock drafts. You're probably going to get drafted. You're going to go play AFL. Well, even if they get AFL, it doesn't mean they're going to play a game. It doesn't mean they're going to have a 15-year long career. So we really need to be pushing that from the parents and going, okay, well, let's get you plan B. Let's make just sure you know what you're wanting to do all right, teachers need to do the same thing. And a lot of teachers do get sucked up into, oh, I've got a, a student that potentially could make the All Blacks one day. Um, so I'm going to let them slide a little bit with their studies or I'm not going to point them in the right direction of what is plan B if you don't actually make it there. And building that resilience in the kids now, not going, not discouraging them from their dreams, but just going, hey, you need to have more skills than just throwing a ball around and scoring a try. Um and once they do get that elite level, you'd want to hope that they've already got those skills. So they then turn around to their club or to the All Blacks and they go, I want to study this. And this is what I want to move into as well, because I've had the support. I've had the guidance while I was growing up going that I'm not going to take this opportunity for granted. I know it can't last forever. And if it does, that is fantastic. What a life that I've lived. But if I have two or three years with the All Blacks and then I transition out, then I've got something to fall back on. And I understand it. I've built the resilience. I've built the skills to be able to overcome that um, disappointment. And it's okay to obviously be disappointed when you transition out of elite sport, but I'm going to go into, you know, marketing. I'm going to go into accounting or I'm going to be a chippy or I'm going to be a plumber because that's what I want to do. Um, but we need to be do building that from early. And I think Wayne hit it on the head when he was talking about that family is that it does come back to the parents to instill that in your kids early. Now, also, you were talking about people transitioning out of sport, but sometimes that transition isn't always on the player's terms. You know, you can get, you can be a, a player who's done everything right. You've got all the talent in the world. Your future is going to be assured, but then you get an injury and then your career is over. And, you know, that, that's got to have a massive impact on players. And is that something you sort of talk about in your, in your talks as well? Or is that probably more what you deal with in your one-on-one -on -one sessions? We probably don't go too heavily into it specifically. That transition is an injury. We we touch on it when we talk about resilience and we're talking about building resilient skills and being able to adapt to a situation to be able to pivot. Now, life is, as we know, it's not a straight path. You have to adapt. You have to pivot. You have to turn. Life is going to hit you in different ways. 
And what we say in, in our resilient session is obviously feel the disappointment, feel the, you know, the anger and the hurt that comes from an injury uh, and it cuts your career short. Uh, and this is, again, we talk about grassroots to elite level. It's, it's everybody all the way through. Um, but we also go, right, well, you need to start to think, and this is where your resilient skills come in, is, is what can I do? And instead of saying, look at what I can't do, it has to be, well, what can I do? And we see this with people that are injured. They either go, okay, I'm going to try and rehab from this if I can and actually get back in a season or, or two. But if it's a career-ending injury and they, they can't play again, okay, where can I pivot to? Can I pivot to coaching? Can I become a water carrier? Can I become a runner? Maybe I become the club wellbeing officer and go and study counseling or psychology. Maybe I become a sports trainer and become strapping, or maybe I go and be a masseuse. If you're wanting to stay in the sporting club, which we obviously we encourage everyone to do, what can I actually pivot to rather than I can't play now, you know, the world's crashing on me. Again, feel that it's okay. Go and get support counselor or psychologist or a sports sports psychologist um, who's going to obviously have the knowledge and the skills inside that, but it really needs to turn to, well, what can I do? And you can see some of the greatest coaches and the greatest assistant coaches and the greatest support staff probably come from people where their careers have been cut short. And they had the resilience, they had the skills where they could pivot um, and they could turn to being um, something that's going to not just impact themselves and their family, but people that impact 40, 50, 60 people if it's an AFL club or the 23 players that are on the All Blacks. You now have a an impact on all of those players plus their families. Uh, and if you didn't pivot and you didn't adapt and you didn't learn, then you're not going to be able to do that. Um, so it's really interesting when you look at some of the greatest coaches may not always be the best players. And then some of them may have had what they would say their career is cut short or they've had an injury uh, and they go into that coaching field or they go into that support field or they go into business. Mm-hmm. They use the skills that they've learned from their you know, high performing careers in sport and they adapt that to fit into the business business world. And usually a lot of them become quite successful because they've built that routine of, you know, this is my mental routine, this is my physical routine, and I'm going to now transfer that from elite sport into a, a business or into the work into the workforce. Um, and you've already got those skills that most of the people around you don't have and they're still trying to build because they haven't had the discipline to get to the level that you did. Okay, life's thrown you a curveball. Where can I pivot to? What can I do? You work across multiple sports, don't you? Not just AFL. Um, yeah, all sport. You name a sport, mate. We've probably done it. <laughs> so, um, are you noticing any differences between sports and their in their uptake on your message? It's a good question. We find there's an uptake for uh, like a program like ours, like the actual service of ours, um, in a lot of in the sports that have. Uh, the infrastructure around them. So an AFL, rugby league, rugby union, you know, from the top down, they're quite good and they've got really good infrastructure there. Um, And they've got, you know, at each individual club, they've got quite big committees because there's so much participation from that. Um, You know, one of the big ones that we do a lot of work with is, is field hockey. Now, field hockey and volleyball, from what we're noticing, is having a massive uptake of players at the moment. Um, and you know we don't know where to attribute that to, but just just from conversation, there's no research behind my comments here, so please don't take this as gospel, everyone. But it's just from the comments that we're getting from people in these organisations is because it's less contact, the very big of concussion and CTE, which is in the media a lot nowadays, you can sort of see that there's a lot of parents trying to shift to the less contact sports or the sports that are probably less dangerous than your rugby league, rugby union, AFL, sort of sports where concussions are mainstream really so there's a big uptake in that and when we do work with a lot of sports that probably don't have the infrastructure like those you know your bigger well-known sports they do get quite surprised that we do go in and actually provide them with this service Um, but they are very wanting of the service uh, but it does become really difficult for them at times to be able to turn around to their athletes and go from a grassroots level go okay everyone let's come together on a tuesday night and and be involved in this session or even doing it online 
because it's not as structured as your Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday games for an AFL netball, rugby league, rugby union. Um, so there's the uptake across all sports is pretty much there. It's just about getting the message out there that, hey, yeah, we do all sports and we're here to provide our support and our education sessions are there as well. Um, but there are sports out there that are resource mm. poor uh, and that just comes from funding and sponsors and those sorts of things where you'd want your elite athletes to be able to have, you know, the same support as what a, you know, an AFL or rugby union, rugby league sort of clubs do. Uh, but if they are resource poor, then it does become really difficult for that, uh, for them to be able to do you know, programs like ours or have a sports psychologist that's dedicated to their sport. Um, but the uptake as to answer your question, the uptake is pretty much the same across the board. It's just whether or not the, organizations have the resources and the ability to bring their athletes together to you know sit through an education session excellent and interesting observation that sports that are like volleyball and field hockey um, are growing because obviously it doesn't involve that contact i think i would play rugby league again before i play field hockey that that ball zoom in past at 100 miles an hour scares the hell out of me yeah, yeah, I've played a little bit of it in high school, and it'd probably scare me a little bit too. Uh, but we look, we are noticing it. The participation rates after COVID did drop, like we saw that, uh, and we knew that from clubs. Like, oh, we're really struggling to get. You know, we usually have a senior reserve side, and this is across all sports. We're really struggling to get a senior reserve side. Uh, oh, now that's you know we're fully pumping in a lot of sports for that. There are a lot of junior kids are getting back into sport which is great and then transferring across into different sports as well and parents obviously seeing the social aspect of sport too for themselves which is really really good and to hear from some of our our partners that they're actually struggling with facilities because they've got so many teams and so many kids trying to play that they're really struggling to find facilities and where to actually put these games and and you know have volleyball have hockey have you know, basketball's always been strong from a participation perspective, but talking to a club the other day, they're going, you know, we're now looking for another two facilities that we can um, have kids go and play their games in. So that's a really positive aspect of what's coming out. Um, but it really goes back to the education now of more teams means more coaches, which means more volunteers. And, you know, do they have the education around both the positives and, and challenges of mental health? Uh, and that's where organisations like ours come in and, for anyone on this listening, you know, I say to anybody, it doesn't have to be OTLR, work with somebody, work with anybody, work with your local counsellor, work with your local psychologist if you're grassroots level. If you've got organisations in New Zealand, find out who they are, get them in, you know, anything is better than nothing. And we're in a world right now where everyone needs something and, you know, it's going to be a positive experience for your community and, and for your culture. Get any organisation in, it doesn't matter. And if you're sitting there and your committee going, should we do it? Shouldn't we do it? I'm telling you right now, do it. Get just someone in um, because you never know when, you know, there's going to be a day when one of your players comes and goes, I'm, I'm not going great. I don't know what to do. Um, and you go, well, crap, we don't know what to do either. Well, you can turn to an organization like ours and call them and we'll help you through it. Uh, so just have anybody because the participation rates are going huge. Sports, obviously great to build resilience and build positive connections for our kids and for our youth. And we want to keep them involved as long as we possibly can um, and keep them involved in sport for hopefully their whole lives. Now, um, when you're talking about this growth, it made me think about your comment at the start where you said your goal was to try and work yourself, your business out of existence. But if sports keep growing, there's more people coming into the game. I can only see more need for your business. Yeah. And look, I think what we're, you know, what we're trying to do behind the scenes at OTLR and collaborating with the university over here is we're trying to do a research project to understand, all right, well, what are the challenges across all different sporting codes um, and in all sports, uh, a sport, uh, sorry, all sporting codes, all sporting clubs, and then the geographical locations of those clubs. We've been really fortunate with OTLR to, to work in every state in Australia. Uh, you know, we've done a, a sporting club in, in London as well um, via Zoom, which was really, really exciting. And what we notice across all sports and across all locations is there's a lot of similarities. There's obviously some differences, but there's a lot of similarities as well. Now, can we use this research project? And this is my ultimate goal, and I know it's going to take quite a long time and take a couple of years. But my ultimate goal, and, you know, there are studies that are already out there that are probably not being implemented as heavily as what they should be. Um, but 
we can work together with other organizations, other universities and actually come together and go, all right, guys, this is from the top down for every sporting association from the AIS, from you know, the New Zealand sporting body, whatever it may be, you can go to every country. This is what you need to do for mental health in your clubs um, and for your athletes and for your administrators, for your volunteers. And if we can do that off, off the research, understand the mental health literacy of our, of our athletes and of our supporters, understand the general health, understand the help seeking behavior and then go, okay, well, what are the recommendations that we should think we should put in place? Let's trial them. Okay. Those things work. They go into a charter or into a playbook or whatever, or into policies and procedures. And then we actually give this to governments. We give this to policymakers and we go, this has to happen. Now we know in sporting clubs, you have to have first aid trained people there so that if someone has a heart attack, you can provide CPR. Well, do you, why is it not a policy that there needs to be someone that has mental health first aid in clubs? So these are just small policy changes that from research we can give. And then in 10 years time, outside the locker room doesn't need to exist because, okay, Bream, we've got all the policies. We know what we need to do. We know what education we need to provide. And instead of doing all the other things, maybe OTLR just becomes the awareness education provider, but hopefully that's already been done in, in primary schools and in high schools and when they're out in their clubs, they don't need us to come there because they're already being taught. So who knows what the next couple of years holds, but that's there's there's a lot of other things that we're doing behind the scenes that is not just the education, not just the support that we're providing, that we can hopefully work ourselves out of out of being an organisation because sporting clubs and sporting associations have it all in place and ready well, to go. That's amazing. That um, study sounds really interesting. And I think your organization is well placed to be involved with this research because of the, you know, the geographical area and the sports you work around, you're going to get lots of variables, which will definitely help for that research. It will. We work with an organization called Urban Rec here in Australia. And they do midweek sports. They've got 12 different sports. I can't list them all. Like one of them's dodgeball. They do touch, touch rugby, I think. Um, mixed netball, uh, the 12 sport, it, it'd go on forever. I, I, I can't list them off, but they're our biggest wellbeing partner and they're just, they're midweek sports. So they're not a, you know, um, they're not your, your typical Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday game competition type of thing. It's midweek. It's fun. If you win the grand final, great. You get a small trophy, but if you're the most fun team to play against throughout that competition season, you get a big uh -huh. trophy because everyone votes on where you're the best ones to play against. They're our biggest part. They've got 16,000 athletes that play wow. per week, which is wow. huge, massive, massive. Like they've got such a big reach there, but they, they're not your typical athletes that people would think, okay, they're not part of, a, I guess, a registered um, league. They're not part of a you know specific competition that goes on for national 18 sport. weeks. It's midweek yeah. sport. Yeah, and not a national sport. It's just midweek sport, a bit of fun. Um but they've got such a high attendance rate because they're such a well-run organization. But let's get you know, that research from those people as well. Okay, what is the mental health literacy? What are you feeling as an athlete? Even though if you don't call yourself an athlete and you go, I oh, my only exercise for the week is this one sport I play at a, at a midweek fun thing, you're still an athlete. Mars. You're still getting out there. You're part of a team sport or an individual sport. You're still out there doing something. Um, that's going to be great research to get as well and, and a great organize, organization to be involved with. I can with. imagine that study will take a couple of years at least to get all that sort of information together. It sounds like it's going to be pretty big, but it'll be interesting to read the, the outcome of it. it. Yeah, no, I'm looking forward to it too, mate. I didn't go to uni, so uh, that's why I sort of, I just get the research. I give it off to people that have had more more study and, and more knowledge than I do, and then they, they have a look at it and can determine what we're – what we can do and what recommendations we can put into sporting clubs from, as I said, a lead all the way down in the, in the grassroots. Well, mate, it sounds like yourself and your organization are doing some wonderful work out there. And I really want to thank you for your time this morning. It's uh, been really interesting for myself and I hope everyone watching or listening also has taken something away from the conversation. Uh, it's been really good having a chat with you. Thank you for having me on. Cheers, mate.